Today we're going to do something a little different. Uh, I am going to spend most of this message simply reading scripture to you. I'm going to do that because over the last number of years, as I have, have matured, as I've been praying and studying God's Word, one of the things that has jumped out at me is God's heart for the powerless, uh, for the poor, for those in need. Uh, it is something that has just been, been building in me and as I have continued to serve in some locations where there was great need, I have simultaneously gotten more frustrated with those that are in need and not willing to work and more generous to give to those in need. There are some that are in need because they are not willing to work. And I'm going to be honest. I think what the scripture says that we, the way we should treat those who are unwilling to work, not those that are unable, but those that are unwilling to work. We should take the passage where Paul says, those who are not willing to work, neither will they eat. But, at the same time, there are people that are willing to work, that have worked hard, and sometimes because of circumstances that are not their fault, they become in need. And how do we respond to them? As we read these scriptures in a minute, I want to, to tell you a story that will maybe kind of set the parameters for you. Just about two weeks ago, our church received a phone call from an individual here in Sanger that was <clears throat> had broken their hip. And because they were about, this individual was about two years from retirement age, so about 64 years old. She fell, she broke her hip. Because of that, she was not able to get to work. She had gone two months without being able to work and still had about another month before she'd be able to get to work. Because it was her right hip. You know, she said, if it was my left hip, I would already be able to work because I could drive. And, and she needed a way to be able to get to work in order to, to work. She said, I'd be able to go back to work now, but I can't because it's my right hip. I can, she goes, I can push the gas pedal. I just can't get over to the brake quick enough. I said, well, I don't want you driving that. <laughs> but she was in need. You know, the, the sad part of the story is, if she had fallen and broken her hip when she was 67 years old and retired, she would have been fine. But because she was 64 and not yet retired, uh, she was in dire financial struggles. <laughs> and so she contacted the church, told us what was going on. We got some help for her, took care of just a couple of little things that gave her just enough cushion so that she knew she would be able to make it until she got back to work. And you know, helping out in that situation felt good. Because here was a lady that has worked hard her whole life. Never had the, you know, really high paying job. But she'd always made it. She'd always paid her own bills, taken care of herself. And now here, through no fault of her own, she was in a place where if somebody didn't help her, she'd probably be on the street. And we did. We help, and she's going to be fine. You know, she's got, she's got enough now to make it until she gets back to work and starts getting her paycheck again. I hope that makes you feel good to know that, that we were a part of that. Because the reality is, if you give to our We Care, to our Benevolence Fund offering, you are a part of helping this lady. And she is the kind, that's the person that I think we want to help, right? She's worked her whole life. She, she's not lazy. 
She's not living off of other people's generosity. But yet she wanted, she needed some assistance. And we helped her. As we observe the Lord's Supper today, at the end of the service, we will have a deacon that will be standing at each of these back doors. They're going to stand there with an offering plate. And as you leave this morning, we invite you to give to help those who are in need. It's, we put it into what we call the We Care Fund here at our church. And it is used to support, to help those who have needs. Especially those who have needs because they have been unable to work or something that has happened. Why do we do it that way? We do it that way because we follow the tradition of the earliest Baptist churches. I found learned in seminary that the earliest Baptist churches, when they would observe the Lord's Supper, they would take a special offering, a benevolence offering, to help those who were in need. So here what I'm going to ask you. What does the Bible say about our obligation to the powerless? Well, this is the first time that I'm going to tell you don't even try to open your Bible because you will not keep up. We are going to listen to Scripture that will be here on the screen. I want to just encourage you just to listen. I'm going to tell you these are not in any particular order. They're in Old Testament, and then I come back to the New Testament. But they're not in any order, starting in Genesis and going to Exodus. Just listen. And, and let God's Word, you know, the Bible tells us that the Word of God is living and powerful. That it is active, that, that it is... That it has this incredible ability to convict us and to cut to the heart of our life. And so what I'm going to ask is for you to just simply hear what God's Word says. And I'm going to say this. The verses I'm going to read are not even half of what the Bible says on this issue. Here we go. Exodus 23.11 but during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Job 30, verse 25. Have I not wept for those in trouble? Has my, not my soul grieved for the poor? Job 31, 18. But from my youth I reared them as a father would. And from my birth I guided the widow. And if I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing, or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder, let it be broken off at the joint. For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of His splendors I could not do such things. Exodus 23, 6. Do not deny justice to your poor people in their lawsuits. Proverbs 28, 27. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive many curses. Proverbs 22, 9. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Leviticus 25, 35. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, Help them as you would a foreigner and stranger, so they continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit for them, but fear your God, so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at a profit. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Exodus, or Ezekiel 13, or 18, verse 7. He does not oppress anyone but returns what he took in pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery, but gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. Isaiah 58, 7. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. Proverbs 25, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. 
Proverbs 3, 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you when you already have it with you. Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns and land your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. Then they may appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them, and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. Psalm 112, verse 9. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. Galatians 6, 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Romans 13, 8 through 10. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be, nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or, and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I will tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also and they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Acts 20, 35. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 6, 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Hebrews 13, 16. 
And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. Matthew 5, 42. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. 1 Timothy 6, 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Luke 3, 11. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Mark 9, 41. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. 1 John 3, 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Acts 11, 29, the disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. Luke 10, 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, we know the story up to that point, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. I'll give you just a sample of what Scripture teaches regarding our responsibility to act justly towards all mankind. Especially the powerless. I could go on and on. And, and really have not even read some of the more well-known passages of Scripture. That speak about our obligation to the poor and the powerless. I think what, the reason that I did this. Is as I have gone back and, and thought about the Scriptures. And, and thought about our responsibility to those who are in need. One of the things that, that jumped out at me is how obviously passionate. God is about this subject. How obviously serious God is about our responsibility to those in need. God takes it seriously. He says, pure and undefiled religion. Uh, you, another way to say that, you might say, perfect religion is what? It's to care for the widows and orphans. Uh, folks, we are commanded to be willing to give of ourselves. Tonight, in our business meeting, we're going to be considering a motion from a committee, a team that has been looking at us partnering with First Refuge Ministries in Denton. I will just give you a preview. They're going to say we should. And, and I was really glad when they decided to say that we should, because I thought this for a while. And I, I thought this as soon as I went down and saw what First Refuge Ministries does in Denton, I began to talk with them and recognize the, the way they do their ministry. I thought, man, this is a no-brainer. Oh, we need to go ahead. We need to do this. 
formed a committee. They looked at it, and, and you know, the reality is they could have made a motion the first time they sat down. Because all of them that came together, when they went and saw what First Refugees Ministries did, all of them were like, yeah, this is absolutely what we need to do. Now, they took some time and they went through some things to kind of figure out what were going to be the requirements, you know, what's going to be the cost of it, because yes, there's going to be a cost. Uh, how are we going to do this? They started kind of working through some of that. And so that's the only reason it took them a couple of months that it did, because the first time they sat down together, they all said yes. We need to do this. But folks, we have a responsibility to serve those who cannot, some, sometimes cannot help themselves. I want to give you a challenge today. Actually, I actually want to give you a couple of challenges. Uh, these are on, some of these are on the, the connection card. The first one I want to challenge you is I want to challenge you to commit yourself to giving yourself to God and others in sacrificial service. And commit yourself that you will go out of your way to serve God and to serve others. And then I want you to do something else. This week, I want to challenge every one of us to find a way to serve someone less fortunate. Whatever way that may be. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Because God is going to direct you. And I want to just ask you to pray today. God, help me this week to serve somebody who is less fortunate than I am. That can be a million different ways. It may not cost you any money. It may just cost you time. It might cost you money. But I want to encourage you to find somebody that is struggling. Find somebody that is suffering. And do good for them. In whatever form or fashion that may be. Just simply go out and do good for somebody else. And then when you do that. To inspire and encourage the rest of us. I'm going to ask you either by texting me or sending me an email. Tell me about how, how you did that. How you went out and served somebody else. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your stories. I'm going to take your names out of them. Take all names out of them. And we're going to put those onto our Facebook page. Not so that we can brag about how look good, good look, how great we are. But sometimes we just simply need encouragement. We need to be encouraged about opportunities and ways for us to go out and to serve somebody else. Because some of us are not that creative. And so I want to encourage you. Go out and do good. Be a blessing. And God has commanded us over and over and over in His Word that we are to do this. So I'm going to challenge you this week to go out and do good. Be a force for God's kingdom. This church has many ministries that serve those that are less fortunate. We have God's table with a mobile food pantry youth ministry, our student ministry, our children's ministry, and many times on Wednesday night, folks, those in need walk in this building in children and youth on Wednesday nights. One of the reasons that Ryan started feeding the kids on Wednesday night is because he recognized that, that we have these youth and children coming here on Wednesday nights that are not getting food at home. We live in a community of need. We need to be God's hands and God's feet serving our community. We do a lot. But honestly, I don't think we do enough. We do a lot because we do it together. But I don't think we do enough 
Because I think too many times we just focus on what we do as a church. And folks, God is calling us to continue to serve this community together and to continue those things that we do together. But I think God is also calling us to individually go out into our neighborhoods, into our communities, and be a force for His kingdom, to serve His kingdom. So I, I challenge you, commit yourself today to be God's hands and feet in serving those who are poor and powerless, those who are in need. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, the opportunity that you give us every day to worship you. But Father, we also thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you. But Father, I pray that as we conclude our worship here in a little bit, Father, I pray that we would be reminded of how much you gave us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we take of this Lord's Supper, that we would be reminded of the sacrifice that you made. And Father, there was, there was nothing that we could do to earn our salvation, to earn your love. And yet you chose to love us enough to give your Son for us. And Father, I pray that we would take that same kind of attitude and that we would give of ourselves to our community. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand.